really is uh, a privilege uh, this morning that I get to introduce you to our guest speaker, Professor Ron Sider, um, who has many, many years of experience both as a theologian and social activist. And um, one of the things that, that I really appreciate about, uh, we had Ron share with us yesterday um, in a public lecture, just a real passion for God and a real passion for the Word and for how that word transforms our engagement in society. And so it really is a uh, great joy that we get to uh, welcome you to the podium, welcome you to the front, as you share a word with us as a community in our chapel session. So join me in welcoming Professor Ron Sider. Greetings, uh, brothers and sisters, in the name of the risen Lord Jesus. It's a delight to be here again, as I said uh, yesterday. Uh, I've had the privilege of being in South Africa several times, and uh, privilege, of, <coughs> privilege of being here. Uh, thank you. Um, at uh, Cornerstone before, so it's it's great to, uh, to be back. Now I've devoted uh, a lot of my life uh, to um, trying to persuade Christians to be more engaged in questions of racial justice and economic justice and peacemaking and so on. But the title of my message this morning is I'm not a social activist. I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ, the Savior and Lord of this whole universe. The inner city uh, black-white congregation uh, where my family and I worshipped for a number of years uh, often had the choir sing this song. Jesus, you're the center of my joy. All that's good and perfect comes from you. You're the heart of my contentment, hope for all I do. Jesus, you're the center of my joy. And that's what I want to talk about uh, for a little while this morning. Now, I've been blessed in so many ways in my life. Wonderful Christian parents who loved each other dearly and their Lord even more lovely, gifted woman, Arbutus, to whom I've been married for almost 54 years. Three wonderful children, great education, ministry opportunities that way, went way beyond what this farm boy ever imagined. And at the center of all of that goodness and joy is Jesus Christ, my Lord. My parents taught me, by their words and even more their actions, what the little motto that they hung in my bedroom on that far in that farmhouse used to say, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Jesus will last. Now in university, when classical intellectual doubt led me to question whether an honest thinker in our modern scientific world could still believe in historic Christian faith, at that point a brilliant Christian professor helped me see that the historical evidence for Jesus' resurrection was really very strong. And when the typical problems that invade every marriage, even the best Christian marriage, came to us and threatened to destroy the joy and happiness that my wife Abunus and I had enjoyed for 15 plus years, at that point, the commands and the power of Christ kept us faithful to each other and enabled us to work through the tough challenges and discover a better, stronger, deeper, more satisfying marriage. When new opportunities as an evangelical social activist opened up in my life, leading my earlier sense of call to being an apologist for historic Christianity in the secular university, when that happened, I resolved to keep Jesus, the full biblical Christ, at the center of my heart and my theology and my work. I resolved to ground my social activism in historic Christian faith and maintain a strong passion for evangelism. Jesus, you're the center of my joy. It's you I love, you I adore and worship, and you I seek to follow and obey. Now, whenever I think carefully about Jesus, I'm utterly astounded. About 2,000 years ago, in a little corner of the Roman Empire, an obscure Jewish carpenter claimed to be the long-expected Messiah. His people, of course, were expecting that there would time come when the Messiah would arrive and drive out the conquering Romans, begin a new age of peace and justice, and it would be a general resurrection of the dead. But 
but the authorities crucified him, using the most shameful and vicious death possible. Why? To prove that he was a fraud. Then just three days later, his astonished disciples reported he rose from the dead. And within a very short time, these strict Jewish monotheists, whose most basic belief that God is one, these monotheists started telling the world that the carpenter from Nazareth was God in the flesh, Lord of the universe, reigning king, even though Caesar mistakenly thought he was still in charge. What an utterly amazing thing for a handful of oppressed Jewish colonials living at the edge of this powerful Roman Empire. What an amazing thing to preach and believe. So let's explore this incredible development a bit more carefully under four quick points. Jesus' Gospel, Jesus' death and resurrection, Jesus' person, and Jesus' agenda. And first, Jesus' Gospel. Virtually every time that Jesus talked about the Gospel, he says the Gospel is the good news of the Kingdom. The fantastic news that the long-expected Messianic Kingdom the Jews were looking for was actually now breaking into history in his person and work. Now if Jesus had said that the Gospel was just the forgiveness of sins, then people could accept Jesus' Gospel and go on living the same sinful, racist, materialistic life that they had lived before. The Gospel would be good news of forgiveness, it would be like a one-way ticket to heaven, and you could live like hell until you got there. But Jesus said the Gospel was the good news of the Kingdom. In Jesus' day, as you know, there was intense messianic fervor. The Jews were expecting the Messiah to, Messiah to arrive. And there were a number of Jewish pretenders who arose in the 50 years around the time of Jesus, and they were squelched decisively by Roman crucifixion. The Jews were looking for a conquering military hero who would drive out the Romans, establish Jerusalem as the ruler of the nation, sins would be forgiven, the dead would be resurrected, and there would be a new age of peace and justice. That's what they looked for. Now, indirectly at first, but then more and more clearly, Jesus claimed that he was that long-expected Jewish Messiah. And he offered forgiveness of sins on the basis of sheer divine forgiveness and divine grace. And he began to create justice and wholeness in persons and society as people began to embrace his teaching. He, Jesus, and his new community of disciples challenged the status quo in all kinds of radical ways, in his attitude toward the poor, attitude toward the marginalized, lepers, and the lame, and his attitude toward women, his attitude toward violence. The masses were excited, but also puzzled, because contrary to popular messianic hopes, Jesus rejected violence. He called on his followers to love even their enemies. And the kingdom he announced was certainly a public, visible, new social order where all broken relationships were being transformed and healed, but it was not a new Jewish political kingdom to be established by military power. This Nazarene carpenter and rabbi also startled people with some of the claims that he made. He not only claimed to be Messiah, he also claimed to have divine authority to forgive sins. And at his trial, he claimed to be the Son of God. Jewish leaders rightly considered that to be blasphemy. And the Romans viewed all messianic pretenders as a serious political threat to Roman rule. So they worked together to kill him, to prove that he was wrong. Since Jewish messianic expectation declared that the Messiah would lead a successful military campaign to drive out the Romans and inaugurate the new messianic age, crucifixion, therefore, provided powerful, indisputable proof that Jesus' messianic claims were false, he was a pretender and a fake. There was only one conceivable conclusion for a first century Jew on the evening of Jesus' crucifixion. Jesus' claims were false, he was finished, he was a fraud. But that would have been the last word about this Nazarene curse. But for one thing, on the third day, after his disgraceful death, first the women and then the disciples reported they had found the tomb empty and that they met the risen Jesus. If that really happened, everything looks fundamentally different. But can a modern person in our scientific world 
still responsibly with intellectual integrity, believe in that kind of miracle, believe that the tomb was truly empty and that Jesus rose bodily from the dead. Now obviously there are philosophical naturalists around who believe that nothing exists except the material world that science can describe in principle. So miracles of course are impossible in that worldview. But if a transcendent God exists, then of course that God could do miracles in our world anytime God chose. So as long as you start with an open mind, rather than a dogmatic, philosophical bias against even the possibility of miracle, the crucial question is an historical one. What historical evidence is there that Jesus, in fact, was alive on the third day? A few years ago, I read a massive scholarly book, 750 pages, by the New Testament scholar N.T. Wright. I think he's one of the best New Testament scholars living today. A massive book on the historical evidence for Jesus' resurrection. Relax, I'm not going to give you all that this morning. But four or so quick points. First of all, the fact that the women were reported to be the first people to meet the risen Jesus is actually strong evidence for the accuracy of that claim. You see, first century Jewish principles of evidence said that the word of a woman was useless in court. They didn't think she had the brain power to get the facts straight, so she couldn't testify. So if the disciples had made up the resurrection stories, then the last thing in the world they would have said was that women were the first people to meet him. The only plausible explanation for the gospel accounts that women were the first people to meet him was that it actually happened that way, and they were too faithful to the historical record to say otherwise. In the Gospels, and Acts, and Paul's letters, it's perfectly clear that it was the empty tomb and the resurrection appearances that transformed these very discouraged disciples. After all, they were good Jews who knew what crucifixion of a claimant to the city was Messiah. They knew what that meant. But somehow, these very discouraged disciples were transformed into daring, bold evangelists. Something dramatic had to happen to make this astonishing change. The only good explanation is that they met the risen Jesus. The early Christians, most of whom, as we know, were Jews, started proclaiming amazing, started um, proclaiming and living out amazing changes in the Jewish understanding of what would happen when the Messiah came. They certainly believed that Jesus was the Messiah, that's why they called him Christ, and they proclaimed that the new Messianic age has truly broken into our history. But contrary to the Jewish expectation for the time of the Messiah, the old age of sin and injustice continued. Something had happened to produce this big change where the old age continued while the new age of Messianic time got started. Again, of course, the resurrection explains that. And furthermore, according to Jewish Messianic hope, the Messiah was supposed to bring a general resurrection when the Messiah came. But that didn't happen. Jesus was raised from the dead as a foretaste, they said, of that general resurrection, which was still in the future. But the general resurrection would happen only when Christ returns. For another example, something very dramatic had to change in order for the Jews, who always worshipped on Sabbath, to start worshipping on Sunday. If the resurrection happened on that Sunday morning, again, that's an explanation for that. Now, I can go on citing the historical evidence, but I think what I pointed to very briefly is enough to show that responsible intellectuals in our modern scientific world are on solid ground when we claim that Jesus was truly bodily alive on the third day and the tomb was empty. Thus far, I've talked about uh, Jesus' gospel and Jesus' resurrection. Thirdly, Jesus' person. The resurrection, of course, radically affected the disciples' understanding of who Jesus was. Rather than a discredited messianic pretender, Jesus was clearly God's Messiah. And almost immediately, and this is the most astounding thing, the strict Jewish monotheists began to say a lot more about the carpenter from Nazareth. When he personally met the risen Jesus, Doubting Thomas blurted out the incredible words, My Lord and my God. Saul of Tarsus was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, one of the strictest Jewish monotheists of the first century. 
Now, in that time, there were Greek and Roman polytheists running around who claimed that gods and goddesses appeared on earth and did all kinds of strange things. Jews knew better. They knew there was only one God. And Saul was the strictest, most educated of those Jewish monotheists. They were the least likely people in the world to start saying that a carpenter from Nazareth was God in the flesh. That's exactly what they started to do, exactly what Paul started to do after he met Jesus. In Philippians 2, 10 and 11, Paul says, At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now this passage is almost quoting and certainly echoing Isaiah 45, 20 and following. In that Old Testament passage, Yahweh mocks the idols, rejects all of the other gods as false, and says he alone is God. Yahweh says, to me every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear. The rabbinically trained monotheist, Paul, takes these words from the mouth of the one God in Isaiah and applies them to the carpenter from Nazareth. Now the word that Paul uses for Jesus here is the Greek word kurios. When they translated the Old Testament, the Hebrew Old Testament, into Greek, and they came to the word Yahweh, the one God, they used the Greek word kurios. So when Paul says that Jesus is kurios, he means Jesus the carpenter, his Yahweh, his God. And in fact, the word kurios, along with the word Messiah, became one of the two most common titles used for Jesus, the carpenter. Again and again, first century Jewish monotheists now convinced that God had raised Jesus from the dead, made the most astonishing claims about him. Just let me remind you of a few of the texts. Colossians 1, he is the image of the invisible God. All things were created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. For in him all the fullness of God is pleased to dwell. Or Hebrews 1, long ago God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets, but in these last days he has spoken to us by the Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he has also created the worlds. He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being. Or heard from John 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things came into being through Him, and without Him not one thing came into being. And the Word became flesh, and lived among us, and we have seen His glory, the glory as of the Father's only Son. Finally, Peter in Acts, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. Now, my friends, these are utterly astonishing things for a first century Jewish monotheists to be saying, or for anybody to say for that matter, that the creator of 120 billion spinning galaxies should become a baby in one tiny planet, circling one small star in one out of the way galaxy is utterly astonishing. That the creator of the galaxies should model what human life should be then die on a cross and rise from the dead is simply mind-boggling. One can only fall on one's knees and worship, and seek and pray for the wisdom to tell others about him in the most winsome way possible. This is the Jesus that I love. This is the Jesus I have tried to follow. Jesus in the center of my joy. And finally, Jesus in general. Remember, Jesus claimed to be the Jewish Messiah who was inaugurating the new messianic time when all things would be made new, when all that sin had messed up would be corrected and transformed. The resurrection and Pentecost confirmed that Jesus was right, that the new messianic age was indeed breaking in. Now to be sure, the early Christians knew that the old age of sin and injustice still continued, but they believed so strongly that Jesus' messianic kingdom was now arriving visibly, tangibly. They believed that so strongly that they knew that in the power of the risen Lord and the Holy Spirit, they could now live, now, the radical kingdom ethics that Jesus had taught them. They embraced kingdom ethics and kingdom expectations of holy living. They believed, as Paul
Paul said in 2 Corinthians 3, 8, that 18, that daily Christians look unveiled to the face of Christ who is unveiled before us and we are being transformed into his image from one degree of glory to another. The transformation that comes from Jesus dawning kingdom affects every area of reality. Certainly our individual persons, but also the community of Jesus' disciples and even in important ways our social systems and the growing creation around us. Now at the center of all of that is personal faith in Jesus Christ, the Lord, whose atoning death on the cross provides a free, unmerited forgiveness for all of us who repent and whose full Holy Spirit now begins to transform selfish, racist, materialistic individuals into more Christ-centered, wholesome human beings. Equally important is the fact that all believers now become part of Christ's new visible body of believers, the church, where if it is faithfully obeying all that Jesus taught, this new peoplehood of the church um, is so wonderful that people can begin to see a new redeemed society of transformed sinners who are now living a little picture of what the kingdom's going to be like when Christ returns. But it's a terrible misunderstanding of what the early Christians believed to reduce Christian faith to a private, personal relationship between me and Jesus. Now, it certainly starts at that wonderful point. But the early Christians believed that the resurrection confirmed Jesus' claim that the Messianic kingdom was beginning to take shape on this earth. And that meant the transformation, not just of individuals, but of society and even the broken creation. That's why the early Christians said that Jesus was now King of kings and Lord of lords. That's why they refused to worship the Roman emperor who thought he was, he, he was in charge. That's why Paul said in Ephesians 2 and 3 that the new multi-ethnic, multi-racial body of believers where the ancient hostility between Jew and Gentile was visibly being broken down. That's why Paul said in Ephesians 2 and 3 that that's part of the gospel. Every area of the created order is being transformed by this good news of the kingdom. Forgiven individuals are now being forgiven and then sanctified day by day. The church is a visible model of a redeemed social order. Still, Lord, forgive us, imperfect, but already beginning to be what the Lord intends. And more than that, the power of the principalities and powers who have dominated a fallen world and twisted social structures that destroy human beings even society is slowly being reformed. And even the growing creation, the non-human world, the rivers and rocks and trees, which has been messed up by you and me and our sin, even that, Paul says in Romans 8, is going to be transformed at Christ's return. He says the groaning creation, quote, will be set free from his bondage to decay and obtain the glorious freedom of the children of God. And at Christ's return, according to Revelation 21 and 22, the glory of the nations, the best of human civilization, will be purged of its evil and taken up into the new Jerusalem, the glorious transformed earth where Christ will dwell with us. And the kingdom of this earth will become the kingdom of our God. Because that is the agenda of the risen Jesus. Because we know where history is going, we work now to establish signs of that coming complete transformation, not just in individuals, but also in the society of the church. And even in small but important ways in the total social order and the creation itself. Because, as the great Dutch theologian Abraham Kuyper loved to say, there is not one square inch of this whole earth that does not belong to the risen Jesus. Jesus' gospel, Jesus' death and resurrection, Jesus' person, and Jesus' agenda must remain at the center of any faithful Christian social action. Social action without an evangelistic passion to share Christ's gospel fails to convert the next generation of Christian social activists. Social action without Jesus' resurrection has no power. Social action without Jesus, true God, and true man 
at the center is no longer even Christian. And social action without Jesus' agenda quickly loses its way. You know, as I look ahead to the next 30 years, I see glorious opportunity. Now, of course, there are enormous dangers and evils in the world and in the church. But if we stay centered on Christ, there is incredible opportunity. In the last 30 years, we've made substantial progress in helping significant numbers of Christians understand that one of the central biblical teachings is that God is on the side of the poor. We make progress in understanding that Christians must be doing evangelism and social action. And all around the world today, there are millions and millions of biblical Christians who are enthusiastically leading people to personal faith in Christ and then throwing their arms around these broken persons, walking with them to correct whatever personal and structural brokenness that sin has brought into the world. There are millions and millions of praying Christians, praying and acting, planting new churches and feeding the hungry, discipling new Christians and partnering in community development, praying for the sick and transforming unjust, racist social structures. The number of holistic local congregations offering the whole gospel for the whole world I believe it is quadrupled and quadrupled again in the last 30 years. And the same and much more could happen in the next 30 years. As you can see, I become truly excited when I think about the way that Christians could literally lead tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people to Christ in the next 30 years and begin to make our world a more just and free and wholesome place to live. But we must be absolutely clear on one thing. We are not social activists. We're disciples of Jesus the carpenter, the creator and the risen Lord of this universe. Jesus, you're the center of our joy. All that's good and perfect comes from you. You're the heart of our contentment, hope for all we do. Jesus, you're the center of our joy.